OK, it's time to be honest. How much of your day do you spend on your phone and on the apps? How much time are you actually scrolling and swiping and liking? Are you addicted? And if you're being really honest with yourself, is it impacting your mental health too? As misinformation and hate pollute the world's information streams like never before, tonight we'll ask if that's just part of the business model of big tech. You'll hear from the insiders speaking out, influencers, online campaigners and those who claim the digital world can be made safer. Put down your phones for just a few minutes, we'll get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, eSafety Commissioner Julie Inman Grant, who worked for Twitter and Microsoft, but now fights to protect us from online harm. You may know him as the host of The Feed and download this show, it's Mark Fennell. In Melbourne, activist Sally Rugg, who played a leading role in the campaign for marriage equality. Tradies who packed in their jobs to become Instagram heroes, they call themselves the inspired unemployed. They are Matt Ford and Jack Steele. Cyber psychologist Jocelyn Brewer is with us tonight and also answering some of your questions. Tristan Harris from the hugely popular Netflix documentary The Social Dilemma. He worked at Google as a design ethicist and is now blowing the whistle on how the platforms lure you in and won't let you go. Please make all of them feel welcome. Uh, remember, as always, you can stream us on iView and on the very thing we're talking about tonight, your socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Uh, we welcome you to join the debate respectfully from home. Our first question tonight comes from Peter Strokorb in the studio. All right. Uh, presidents, politicians, sports stars, celebrities and even business leaders who should all be role models have shown the world that you can now say almost anything on social media without significant repercussions. Lies, misrepresenta <laughs> misrepresentations, disinformation, vicious rumours, foul language, racial hate and other dis discriminating propaganda, innuendos and false news on social media are now a daily occurrence. Even state-owned enterprises are now influencing public opinion by bending or even inventing the truth. What impact will that have on the next generation who will be growing up in a world full of lies? Mark Fennell. <laughs> Great, awesome. <laughs> um, oh, look, I mean, to some extent, that stuff has always existed, and let's not pretend like it hasn't. What is interesting, though, is social media has meant that we now have a fire hose of it, and that means it's very hard for things to be called out in real time. The other component to it, I think, is the fact that certainly things like Twitter, and I know this is a ludicrous thing to say on the most Twitterized show on Australian television, there is something built into the very DNA of Twitter. You know, the, the fastest, snarkiest, funniest response is the thing that gets the most retweets, the most engagements, and I think it would be silly to pretend like there isn't something about the mechanic of that that is changing how we communicate. So I think there is a responsibility that these different tech companies have. Now, certainly over the years, they have done certain things to try and minimise or manage that. Clearly not enough, I think you'd agree, right, that the, clearly there's not been enough that's been done, but I think only now we're really starting to recognise that it's a symbiotic relationship between the tech companies and us, how we're changing and how they need to change as well. Uh, Jocelyn, is it built into the model? In, in terms of the actual, um, you know, social media platforms, there's something about engaging and, I guess, having that interaction that makes us fire up. But when we talk about young people and the skills that they actually need to navigate that world, a lot of this is actually built into the Australian curriculum, believe it or not, in the, uh, in the capabilities, things like um, the ethical understanding, the ICT capability, which actually includes ethical use of, of technology as a part of that. And I think without, you know, lading, um, putting more on teachers to actually have to teach the curriculum, that's all there. And in fact, we as adults probably need those lessons just as much as the screen ages do. But do we even understand the world that exists now? I mean, we're, we're sort of struggling as a society, I think, to even describe what's happening, this sort of proliferation of, of false information, fakes, lies, harassment. If we can't really get a handle of it, how can we teach children how to live in it? 
Sure, and I think the, the the thinking skills that underpin the the you know literally barrage of information and that tsunami of information that's coming at us each day. So part of that is the the capabilities, the cognitive skills that I think sometimes we forget that the technology in our skull is just as kind of <laughs> you know yeah, totally. powerful as what's being created here, and we need to take back control of that, I guess, which is the whole point of this document. So the question is about fake news, the misinformation. Jack, do you, have you got friends, family? that buy into this stuff, believe the conspiracy theories? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I got... Not going to name anyone. Sorry. No, definitely. You know a few people that have been misled so heavily that they've just completely changed the way they go about even everything, like... What are we talking about? Yeah. Like QAnon conspiracies. or anti-COVID stuff? Yeah, everything. All of it. Um, God, I don't want to... If I say things, people, my mates are going to let me know who I'm talking about. But <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, no, heavily for sure. And how do you find interacting with them? Do you say this stuff's nonsense? Like, what's oh, the exchange? It's just it's heavy because I feel like the people I know, it's they've got so caught up in it, but it hasn't. They don't do anything to to help or to speak out. They just get so invested in it, and it actually kills them. But they, they believe it they so believe much, it, yeah. and they can't, you, they can't like you can't tell them anything different. No. They just and That's they what just they believe now. Smash you with conspiracies, and you're just like, oh my god. And it's hard stop. to get into those conversations, right? Because yeah, once you start them, you're like, I don't want to be the friend that has to tell you all the things you believe are kind of bullshit. Yeah, like, yeah, no one yeah. wants to be that guy. Yeah. And you're just like sitting there going, yeah, yeah, no, for sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I agree. <laughs> but you're the just, problem. Yeah. yeah. The earth is flat, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when, when somebody's dating a terrible person, you know, you don't want to be the person that says you're dating a Daryl, exactly. you know? Like, yeah. you kind of yeah, come yeah. in there and they're not going to listen necessarily. It's later that they're Love like, that. oh, why didn't anyone tell me? So there's that kind of sense of, like, not knowing how to navigate some of those spaces where they're, you know, yeah. they're your mates and That's you kind of want to go, well, what happened that you started yeah. to kind of take that on? But Julie, we're 100%. living through a pandemic right now. This is more than just people believing stuff on the internet. This is a genuine safety issue, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, and having worked within Twitter, I have to say there is a real ethos and a real deep belief within this, in the company that um, it is a platform for free expression, that, you know, the, the internet has become the new town agora and when things go viral, it's great when things go viral, when it's an advertising or marketing campaign, but when it's a trolling attack, it's a cons conspiracy theory, or it's um, state actors engaging in disinformation, it can be detrimental to democracy and the social fabric that we're living in. And for our kids, back to Peter's point, we all have a role to play here. We need to be role modeling for our kids. You know, we can't tell them to get off Fortnite while we're scrolling through our Twitter feed at the table. <laughs> mm. um, nor can, if we treat people with disrespect, we don't set limitations, we're, we're, we're not setting them up for success. So we talk a lot about the four R's of the digital age. Respect, responsibility, building digital resilience, because it's not if something's going to go wrong online, it's when, and critical reasoning skills, so that we can help kids discern fact from fic fiction and find that oasis of truth in this desert of misinformation. Uh, Sally, you're in Melbourne tonight. You can't travel out of Victoria because of this pandemic. All of these issues around fake news, misinformation, conspiracy theories, it must feel particularly acute to you uh, sitting there. Yeah, it does. And there was a lot in that question. It was great. I think um, the, the harm that misinformation does goes way beyond, like, being embarrassed of our political leaders or, um, you know, feeling anguish at their terrible behaviour online. Misinformation has terrible material harm in our communities, whether it is, you know, many, many people dying of a virus that shouldn't that shouldn't have, or, you know, Chinese Australians getting attacked in the streets, um, or all sorts of people sort of, like, not wearing masks or, you know, going against health advice. Um, yeah, it, it's misinformation and terrible behaviour online has such serious material impacts that sometimes I feel like it's easy to forget that while we're watching this sort of sideshow of bad behaviour online that, that it, you know, it has real impact in the real world. OK, let me take our next question. It's a video from Joshua Swingler in Pambula, New South Wales. Increasing and retaining the amount of daily active users is a key success measure for most social media platforms, as it represents more people online more often. 
However, this has led to the creation of the Echo Chamber, where we continually serve content and concepts that only reinforce our existing beliefs and biases. Now that the social media genie is out of the bottle, my question is who is accountable for mitigating these unintended consequences? And more importantly, how they might go about doing it? So we put that question to Tristan Harris earlier. It's a great question. I think the technology platforms are ultimately responsible and part of the reason they have to be responsible is we, we have to recognize what's happened. We're about 10 years now into this sort of mass shredding apart of reality because this experiment run by this business model of harvesting human attention has systemically shredded our shared truth into two, three billion, excuse me, different Truman shows. The reason for that is very, very clear. If I'm Facebook or TikTok or YouTube, and when you flick your finger, I have a choice between showing you something that confirms your view of reality, that yes, you're right, the other side is wrong, here's even more evidence of that. So every time you confirm, you, you flick, you get more confirmation, versus another news feed that every time you flick your finger, it shows you a more nuanced view, it challenges your views. Which one of those two is gonna be better at harvesting your attention? Well, the one that, that confirms your view of reality. And so what that means is that each of us get a different confirmation of reality, and it takes our shared truth, our shared facts, and it shreds it into different uh, echo chambers, as, as your listener uh, and guest ha has said. So um, I think we have to first realize that this has happened to our society, almost like Pearl Harbor was an attack on sort of American soil, we have to realize that we as a civilization have been bombed by a business model, but that bomb wasn't kinetic. It was a kind of um, cultural uh, uh, sort of shredding uh, kind of impact on our society. We can't solve this problem if we don't collectively realize that's what's happened to us. And the film gives us a common language, a new common ground about the breakdown of our common ground. And then from there, we have to say, how can the technology platforms upregulate where we or where there's unlikely agreement from different sides and have that rise to the top of the way that we see our reality as opposed to the ways that we individually confirm our reality. But Tristan, the tech platforms say that they do take these things seriously. If you listen to Jack Dorsey from Twitter, if you talk to someone from Facebook, uh, they say that they are dealing with this stuff. Uh, are they not to be believed? Well, sure. I think, I think to varying degrees after many, many years of public attention and you know, uh, yelling and screaming by people in the community that I come from who've been trying to say this is an enormous problem. Uh, that has not been taken seriously until recently. Uh, I'd say the last couple of years in some cases, I think Jack Dorsey has been stronger on this than, than others potentially. Uh, but I don't think that, you know, while they're making efforts, it, they can't change the DNA of what they are. Their business model is for things to be able to go viral and pop to billions of people overnight, right? That's the whole business model. I can post something and next thing you know it, I can reach a billion people because it went viral. That unchecked virality model is at the root of why fake news can spread six times faster than true news and why conspiracy theories can dominate our public discourse. We have 10 years of damage to Twitter to repair. All right, our next question is from Ranjit Ramachandran in the studio. Thanks, Hamish. After watching The Social Dilemma on Netflix, I was finally convinced to remove all the social media apps from my phone. And even though it's been quite a recent move, um, I'm already seeing massive benefits from staying away from what I call the social pokies. My partners also started doing the same and we would like to thank uh, people like Tristan Harris for educating us about this addiction crisis. However, when I was on social media, I was aware of what's happening in the world you know, currently. And I also followed groups that discussed subjects that were re of relevance to my field of work and my interests. And now I feel disconnected from that world. And it's hard to strike the balance because that apps are designed to be so manipulative when you go back. So my question would be, the move which I made and you know, my partner's making, is that going to be a disadvantage for some of us in the longer term? And is deleting social media apps and a drastic measure, or it, is it an immediate necessity? OK, let me first put that to Tristan Harris. I, I really love hearing that the, the film has had that effect uh, for this couple, and I'm really glad to hear it. You know, the, the, the message of the film is not expecting that everyone, when they see it, will delete social media apps. We know that that's not sustainable, and we know that that's what makes these technology 
uh, platforms inhumane is that we are actually forced to use platforms that are contaminated or toxic for the public sphere and for our mental health. The fact that we don't really have a choice, including if you're a kid and you actually get off the social platform like Instagram or TikTok, you still go to a school where all your friends are still, still talking about you know, gossip and who's dating who, and you'll be socially excluded if you leave by yourself. So that's what really makes these platforms inhumane. But on the question of how do we get access to those same sort of social conversations to make sense of the world, to make sense of what's true, I think what what we really need are uh, non-extractive, non-privately held uh, companies to help us do that. I think Wikipedia is a really good example because you know it's kind of a mir miracle that, that Wikipedia even works at all, that it becomes this sort of collective intelligence for bottom-up sense-making, that lots of people can be actually identifying shared facts, uh, doing talking behind the scenes, and starting to put together articles that piece together what we need to know in a more efficient fashion. Um, what I'm really hoping is that the film actually creates a new ecosystem of alternative platforms where we can have new kinds of conversations. One of the most exciting trends for me is the fact that many people thought until the film that you couldn't ever start a new kind of social media network to do better sense making of the world. And we're now seeing many more of those than we've ever seen before. And uh, that's an inspiring trend. So do you think big tech, Facebook, Google, Twitter are willing to make sufficient changes so that they're not having this big detrimental impact on society? Because it seems they won't even, for example, participate in a conversation about this. Ultimately, the business model of unchecked virality, of engagement at all costs, of attention harvesting, that is the thing that fundamentally has to change. And I think when you have that DNA, it's very hard to change that mid-flight unless, um, you know, from more organizational theory, they say you have to fire about 70% of the employees and restart uh, the culture of the company. And until they change that, everything else they do are like band-aids on broken elbows. You know, it's, it's great that they're starting to look at band-aids. Um, I think, you know, they're trying to do the best they can, but often listening to tech leadership is like listening to a hostage in a hostage video. You know, you see a hostage and they say these things that don't quite make sense until you see the gun that's held to them from offstage, which is their business model, that's making it seem as if they can't say the, the actual true thing, which is that their business model is incompatible with the good of society. But that's where governments can really step in and say, how do we change these financial incentives for the best of the people? Sally Rugg, do you see it that way, incompatible with the good of society? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of truth to elements of what Tristan is saying, but I think um, this sort of, like, unchecked virality and the need to grow and grow your revenue model based on, like, conflict and juicy entertainment and false information, like, media empires have been doing that for a really long time. That's how newspapers sell. That's how people get you to click on um, all sorts of stories, tune into the nightly news. But you um, don't know many young people addicted to newspapers, do you? <laughs> I mean, that you're aware of. They, they might be out there. I mean... It was like, can I count myself? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, um, there, there are generations of people now that are finding it hard to, to actually put the phones down because of these apps. I mean, what you're describing uh, with newspapers just it didn't really exist in the same way. We are talking about something different, aren't we? Sure, yeah, the, the addictive element of social media platforms is a massive time suck. Um, and it displaces other activities like face-to-face -face engagement with friends and going out in nature and all the rest of it. But um, on your initial sort of prompt there, is social media incompatible with good in the world? Absolutely not. Social media creates so much good in the world, um, whether it's through connecting family and friends, whether it's through... Um, you know, providing safe places and communities for minority groups or, like, in my line of work, which is digital campaigning and online activism, you know, letting ordinary people organise together so that they can participate in the decisions made about their lives. Why, then, Julie, does it do so much harm? Well, first I'd say that the internet has become an essential utility, particularly during COVID. And, um, you know, we work, we learn, we entertain, we connect. Um, and this is fundamental to our humanity uh, during lockdown. Um, it has become a much more hostile, much more toxic place because I think people can hurl abuse and it's mostly targeted abuse, targeting women, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, those that identify as LGBTQ and other vulnerable entities, and they can do so with relative impunity. 
And um, so just having your, your Twitter or Facebook account taken down is really not a deterrent. Now, I also don't think we're going to regulate our way out of this or uh, arrest our way out of this problem. Social media holds a magnifying glass up to society. So the societal ills of misogyny and prejudice and racism are surfaced and then are amplified. I absolutely agree with Tristan that we have to shift the responsibility back on the platforms. The way I see it, we call this safety by design. So if but you build how, the roads... How do you do that? I mean, you can't really even get these platforms to engage in a public conversation about these sorts of issues, Mark. No, they tend not to talk. They tend to send you to a, a blog post, which is really useless. I mean, look, just to come back to what you were saying, I don't necessarily... I think you've been put in a really shitty position. You should never have had to delete yourself off these accounts. All that would have been required is they make a series of changes that make the transaction that you have with them more transparent. And that's how I like to think about social networks, right? It is a transaction, OK? You get something and then they get something in return. And there's a few different tools they have that are already available to them that they could roll out. So if, if we want to sort of tackle something like misinformation, right, every time you get serviced a piece of content on the Facebook uh, rank, it should tell you why you're seeing it. You're seeing this because of the following reasons. Now, you can click through and see all that stuff, but nobody ever does it, right? I reckon it should be on everything. You're seeing this because your ex-girlfriend did this on this, this thing here. Like, that would give you some understanding of what's going on inside you, what, it's, what, it, what the decisions they're making for you. And, like, look, The Social Dilemma is far from a perfect movie. It's a polemic. They don't, you know, go to the other side. They don't look at the people who are actually working at Facebook and Google today. But what it does really effectively is it visualises a sense of what they have on you. And currently, the terms of the deal that all of us have with social media services is unfair. It's unfair because the terms of the deal are opaque because you don't really know what they really have on you. And all I'm saying is if we had a little bit more clarity in the day-by-day, -day, you know, interactions with it, if we had a little bit more clarity about why we're being served what we're being served, we would at least have clarity over, you know, the way we're being manipulated. Jack and Matt, you're sort of feeding this beast. You've made yeah. a business mm. for yourselves out of it. Fucking that. egged in a second. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you addicted? I mean, are you addicted to the likes? Oh, I've oh. deleted the app of my phone a couple yeah. of times just because, like, there's this period of time where I'll just get home from work, I'll just be scrolling on it and, like, like think it's 15 minutes. Two hours later, you're just like... Yeah. What the hell, where the time go? Yeah, nothing good came out of it. So I was just like, you know, you're just watching someone you don't even know. It's like what they're having for dinner and you're like, what the hell? So I just delete off the app for like two weeks and it's good. It's kind of like you just live in the present and you're you just kind of like... Nothing changes. Like, you feel way better mentally, but nothing changes. But as you were saying, your friends are hanging out and you don't know... They, you know, all the message chats and all that. That's so, the so, what part. Drew, so what is it that draws you back in? Your friends on the chats? Oh, people yeah, I guess you feel like you're DMs? missing out. Whole, like, everyone's on it, so, like... Everyone's a I guess it's fear I mean, of missing out. Like, you don't know what's happening. Yeah. You feel like you're a bit, yeah, disconnected from everything. What about the jo JOMO? The joy of missing out? <laughs> what is it? The JOMO. JOMO? This is the opposite oh. of FOMO. Oh. FOMO, yeah. 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 The joy of missing out, I like that. But what does this say, Jocelyn, about the world that's been created? If these guys are saying, well, we, we take a break from it to sort of be in the moment, be present, we're quite happy, but then we feel like we then need to get back onto it mm -hmm. to be part of what's going on. Well, what it says is we have an... Um, we're completely wired to need to connect and to belong to something and be a part of something. And I guess what many people don't realise is that you can, to some degree, curate your feed and, and mm. you know, mute the person who all they do is post photos of their kids or their food or whatever and actually follow, you know, hashtags and movements and activate some of the things that you really care about. And research that was done by the female lead has actually shown that when young women populate their feed with things that are inspiring and have that kind of, um, I guess, more nutritional nutritious feed of what, what they're actually consuming with their eyeballs, they have much more positive mental health outcomes. So, hang on, what are you telling these boys they should replace the things they currently look at online with what? I don't know. We'll have a little chat about that later. <laughs> 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 you know, it, I think that... Um, but what's a the, nutritious the, digital diet? What does well, it actually look like? Yeah, yeah look, <laughs> it's, it's complex. It sounds but pretty imagine, boring. Imagine um, apps and games came with nutritional labels. So, you know, what we're asking here really for is ethical design and to call out the principles that are used to manipulate us. So how much narcissism versus empathy is actually going to be generated? Um, so while I can't, you know, attempt to do that in this lifetime, there's lots of organisations 
organisations that, that are doing that and, and, and Julie with Safety by Design is absolutely, you know, a big part of that international movement yeah. where we, you know, I was a you know, in commerce teacher. The first lesson that we used to have was caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. So we as consumers have to be conscious and we have to make bigger demands, which is, again, part of what's happening here, okay. and, and know that we can curate our, our digital diet. Just for context, boys, how many followers do you have? <laughs> 617,000 on Instagram. Okay. When I, uh, well, I don't know. We, uh, I don't and, know. Uh, it's going like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like 600 and something. And thousand. how many likes would you get on a post? Oh, God. I'm not sure. 100,000, maybe. Not, not really. We kind of look at comments. Nah. We look at, we so you put, put a video up and you just get obsessed with it for 10 to 20 minutes and then you'd never look at it again because you cringe so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How long though. did it take you to work out that that was healthy for you though? Because was there a period of time you, you know, when you st first started posting stuff, you're like, I have to look at every comment yeah. and you had to step back? At the start, at a the little start, bit. Yeah, I mean, the more. best answer to your question, I reckon, is to find the balance, like to just have a good balance somehow. And you can actually put um, limits on your apps, which mm. I do myself. It, it yeah. doesn't work that well, does it? Yeah. 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 yeah, like one minute longer and yeah, yeah, and yeah. then 15 minutes and then... 15 minutes addition longer. you can put onto it. I guess the nature work. of a digital detox is it's kind of like a juice fast. You get really hangry on about the third day and eat yeah. a burger. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. we have to find a better way to do this, which is actually mm. tune into our emotions. And again, using this technology mm. to notice, how's this making me feel? Am I missing my community? Um, but I'm not really missing, you know, this part of things. And we, there are some kind of things that we can tweak within those platforms already to some degree. There's a, much further to go. I still think it's putting too much responsibility on us as users. Like, we're not the ones making gazillions of dollars, no. enough money to, like, buy guan. Mm. You know well, what I mean? These like, guys might be. They, you, you guys can buy guan. I'm going to show <laughs> everyone Hamish, here. Hamish, can I? Just before that, Sally, I just want to show everyone what these boys do. This oh, is, God. This is Matt and Jack. <laughs> <laughs> they make everyone close your eyes. Here they are. Uh, Put their head down. Cheers. <laughs> Would you care to explain what you actually do? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't even know. People ask us that yeah. and we still don't even know. We don't know how to answer it. We, we, yeah, this is relevant, this Bindi video. <laughs> oh. But you, may, you, may, you do skits. Yeah. You do dances. We do. Yeah, this is stupid things, really. Yeah. Can, film I, it. can okay. I translate yeah. young people into kind of my generation? It's kind of like the hey, hey, it's Saturday. Yeah. It's kind of like the, you know, it's it's entertainment. It's yeah. bloody good fun. I hope you're not comparing these fine young men with <laughs> red faces. No, 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 no. That, there was some cool things that came out of red faces <laughs> back you. in the day. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's take our next question. It's a video from Carly Finlay in Melbourne. Hi, I'm Carly Finlay from Melbourne. I'm a writer and most of my work is done online. Over the years, I've endured an enormous amount of online abuse from disability and race hate speech to death threats and also threats to hack my website. When I have reported it to the eSafety Commissioner, to the social media platforms and to police, the response has mostly been compassionate. However, the eSafety Commissioner and the police don't seem to have any way to act on this. When will the eSafety Commissioner and the police get more power to act on online abuse? Julie. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Carly. And Carly has endured um, a lot, as as do 70% of the women that come to our office reporting um, cyber abuse. Um, when we were set up five years ago, um, it was as the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, and we're the only government agency in the world that provides a service or serves as a safety net so that we can compel takedown of harmful content for cyberbullying directed at a child, and we have a 100% compliance rate in terms of doing that, um, for image-based abuse for all Australians. So that's taking down nude images or videos from hundreds of sites of overseas, and we have about a 90% success rate. Where we weren't given powers initially is in dealing with adult cyber abuse. So, the so why, why don't you have the power to enforce takedowns? Um, only for a serious adult cyber abuse. The government is updating our legislation, reforming the Online Safety Act right now, and it's expected, it's been in consultation for about 10 months, mm -hmm. that serious cyber abuse modelled on the cyberbullying and image-based abuse schemes will be introduced, so we will be able to compel takedown. So what would that mean in practice? If someone was harassing or abusing Carly, uh, you would be able to go to the platform and force them to remove it? Yes, if, if it was reported to the platform and it didn't come down, it was considered serious cyber abuse with the intent to cause harm, 
then uh, we could compel them to take it down. We have that same power right now for youth-based cyberbullying and working with the platforms. They have taken down every single piece. About, we've helped about 2,000 young people. We've helped about 5,000 um, Australians get their um, intimate images and content taken down. Sally, have you ever had to report abuse or harassment online? Uh, yeah, I have. I've been to the police twice. Well, I've, like, did a police report twice, and I don't, I don't really like doing that. I don't think that um, sort of, like, abusive messages should be criminalised. Both instances, there, was, there were reasons why I had to report it. Um, so, yeah, I have. But I think the, the reality is, is that um, social media does allow for, like, anonymised abuse to be sent, um, which is really terrible. But I think for me personally, and, and I know this is, it doesn't speak directly to Carly's question, but just on the topic of abuse on social media, or for me, like, if I ever receive um, a really nasty anonymous message or a nasty message from a stranger, like, that hurts a little bit, but, like, that's fine. It's when... Um, it's like criticism or nasty words from people who you really respect or you kind of know um, or just sort of acquaintances whose opinions you hold in really high esteem. Like, that hurts way more. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mention that is because um, there was this big piece of research that the Pew Centre did uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, and it found that for young people in particular, um, those who say that they have negative experiences of social media, it's not for, you know, body image stuff or the time suck addiction scrolling thing. Um, it's because they report experiences of bullying and rumour spreading. And so it's this same... Uh, it's the ability for, like, a wider social network, pardon the, the reference, um, to sort of gossip, spread rumours, say nasty things behind the protection of a keyboard. So I think abuse from strangers um, is, you know, is really bad, but it's, it's the sort of facilitation of mass um, critique, bullying, shaming that I think is worse. Mark, what about when it's threats? What about if it's more serious stuff? Um... Look, it's funny, listening to you talk about the new legislation and the bar being with intent to cause harm, and my instant reaction is, that bar is too high to clear. The bar should be much lower. And well, we can't go to war with the internet. And, and first of all, the, I think we think that companies need to start enforcing their policies. And that's really what I want to get at, which yeah. is that I'm not sure that... I'm not sure that it should necessarily fall under government remit because there are plenty of governments around the world, not so much ours, but other ones where you don't really want a government to be the arbiter of that. And I think, look, what a threat... I've had death threats at various different points over the years and um, it does something to your sense of safety in an offline space that is hard to describe. And I know Sally's experienced it as well. It's, it's, um, it does something that... You, it, it does something on the inside. And you can't... Just saying to somebody, put the phone down, put it away, doesn't work anymore. And you have to acknowledge that that's something that you don't lose easily. Um, you know, a couple of years ago... Gen I genuine a... fear? Sorry? Genuine physical fear? It's... Yes, but I actually think what's about it is it's like... It's a sense that you don't... You, you're not allowed to exist comfortably like other people are. You look at other people around you and you go, well, you don't know what's going on inside my head. The example I'm thinking of is a couple of years ago, I did a show with a bunch um, of white supremacists on SBS and as I uh, got home, uh, there was all this white supremacist stuff that was like filling up my, my inboxes and um, I just had a son at that point. And your whole sense of mortality is caught up in this moment. And the weird thing is if you were to look at me on the outside, you'd have no concept of what was going on. So, you know, there are reporting functions that do exist. They are out there. Um, they are imperfect. Um, but I think maybe when we interact with people online, it's and I know this is such a terrible cliche, but recognise that you are still talking to a human being. Maybe that person's messed up. Maybe that person's done something wrong. But recognise it is still a person. And that, that like, if you can connect with that humanity, we might just be a little bit better off. This, again, though, is about the individual, isn't it, rather than the platform yeah. taking responsibility. Do you think it is possible 
uh, to actually make these platforms take this responsibility seriously? I, I do, um, and with this new legislation, we will have will have the ability to name and shame, to find them. Um, my experience being both with inside and then um, regulating the, the social media sites is they'll respond when there are revenue threats, there are reputational <laughs> threats, and there are more serious regulatory threats. Um, but, um, but then don't they just threaten to leave those countries like they, they're doing now? Yes, and they, and they did that five years ago when, when Paul Fletcher and Malcolm Turnbull established the e-safety office. They said, we're leaving the country. They threw a tante and said, um, you're going to quash freedom of expression, uh, innovation is going to be undermined. Well, none of those things have happened. So is that what they're doing now? Throwing Literally, that is exactly it, what they are doing they're now. They're throwing a tante. Yeah, it's a gigantic tantrum, and anybody that tells you otherwise is just lying. OK. Let's take our next question. It's from Lizzie Leish in the studio. Thanks. For many, Instagram is a positive experience and increases opportunity for connection and inspiration. Why do you think there are more studies against social media than highlighting the benefits of it. Jocelyn. Oh, the research question is a tricky one. So when we talk about um, the risks and benefits or the correlation data sometimes um, showing that you think using things like Instagram correlate with um, poor mental health outcomes, um, they are correlations and they're not causative. So um, part of what drives, I guess, sometimes research is a whole other question. Um, one of the responses to this would be to get people and, and researchers to actually pre-register what they're looking for. So we can't have researchers kind of of cherry-picking bits of data. Um, and a famous example, I guess, of that is a piece of um, data where they show that the correlation or the negative effect size between using social media and young people's mental health is, um, you know, it's actually 0.04%. So very, very little if you're talking about statistics. If we compared listening to music with kids' mental health, there's actually a bigger negative effect size there. But we're not talking about listening to music and having these sorts of ne negative impacts. Um, so there's lots of tricky things and nerdy stat stuff that we could talk about in terms of that. Instagram is obviously a really visual platform. And so there's lots of, you know, digital diet stuff happening there in terms of the values and attitudes to things like body image and Is, is it harder to be anonymous on Instagram than it is on other platforms? No, not no. really. You can, you know, you might not have a little egg in, in, on Twitter. You might, you know, put some sort of inspo kind of picture or call yourself yeah. something different, but it's, it doesn't make it any harder. So, Jack and Matt, we've heard a lot about the negative side of all of this. Do you see the positives? I mean, do people come and tell you what they get out of it? Honestly, we're so lucky on our page. Like... Our experiences are 99% positive, always. Yeah. We get a lot of nice messages. So many and messages a day, like yeah. of mums to kids that are dealing with huge mental health health problems that open up completely to us. It's insane. Just saying we've helped their day or life or they've quit their job because of us. It's actually insane. How yeah, it, like, it's, it's wild, and we're just like, what? We're just two tradesmen that don't even know yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. Like we didn't really set out to do that, and then it's kind of happened, and yeah. it's pretty cool but but we can see like we're not blind we can see the the bad that does happen but for us we are so lucky like fortunate and, mm. and do you think about if that I with the content that you make though do you because i know obviously humor is a big part of it mm. some humor makes fun of people others more is more inclusive do mm. you is, is are you conscious of that when you're putting your stuff out there yeah definitely Super. we're very conscious of what we're putting out we try and i mean we're pretty like Respectful. Yeah. I know we, brought, we got brought up yeah. well, so we just <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like try and respect people kitchen. as I'm much. Not, as... not sure exactly what's respectful yeah, yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. When we started, yeah. our, our, we're so close with our family, mm. and we were kind of at an age where we're old enough to know better. We did, so we never like swore too much or yeah, no racism, nothing like that. When you're posting something, you're kind of thinking about your parents watching it, and you're like, oh, yeah. they yeah. think that's <laughs> all right. Scared, eh? Yeah. <laughs> your aunties and uncles watching it, so you're like, oh, they probably wouldn't like that. Yeah. Turn it down a little bit. Which is harder to be funny sometimes, but I don't know. It somehow works. Trying to find the balance. Sally, yeah. I can hear you're trying to get in. Oh, thanks. I was just going to say, like, I'm, I'm really pleased um, for Matt and Jack that their experience has been one of, like, really positive messages and no abuse or harassment or anything like that. But the reality is, is that if you're a 
kid who's LGBTIQ, um, if you come from a marginalised background, if you speak a language other than English at home, um, if you're poor, like any of these sort of marginalising factors um, mean that you are more likely to receive bullying and sure. nasty messages on social media. And just to reiterate my last point, it doesn't have to be from strangers that require like a criminalisation process and legislation in Parliament. I think if we're trying to go to the government to answer our problems for people receiving abuse online, we're going to miss the mark. This is about, I think, like educating people to be kinder to each other and um, helping to explain, particularly to young people, the impact that they can have um, when they're hidden behind keyboards and feeling a little braver than they might when they're yeah. speaking to someone's but, face. But Sally, mm. all of these platforms say they have policies in place that are designed to prevent a lot of this stuff happening. But there is a question about genuine enforcement. Don't you think that they actually have to live up to the promises that they make? I mean, it's unclear to me why, for example, they might be throwing QAnon pages off their platforms now, whereas a few months ago they weren't and other things they allow to, to live and flourish there. There's a fair amount of inconsistency, wouldn't you acknowledge? Mm. I don't think so. I think um, platforms like Facebook care about their brand and their revenue, uh, like their revenue ultimately. And so if something is going to affect their revenue, they will look at changing it. And so with QAnon, um, the backlash against that really harmful right-wing conspiracy had reached a certain level that it was affecting um, advertisers' willingness to come to the platform and it was getting Facebook a lot of bad press. And so they quickly acted on it, even though they said for a very long time that it was... They, they couldn't possibly act on it. It was going to be too hard. It's, and so and, something and like... It really wasn't that quick then, was it, Sally? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a little too late, and that's the problem. It's reactive or in response to current events. Now, let's think about this pivotal U.S. election. You know, we've known about disinformation and misinformation and gaming of the system since the 2016 um, election. It's a month out. Twitter was actually the first mover. They started with banning political ads and then labeling Trump's tweets and then uh, moving to uh, QAnon. It was Facebook and Google that followed. So in the industry, we talk about coopetition. So sometimes we're, com that we're working together to tackle these issues, but other times they're competing to be the safer or less toxic platform. So there are really some interesting drivers, but it's too little too late. And the changes have been incremental rather than monumental. And they have to be dragged every single time. I mean... So Sally's giving them a bit of a free kick, a free pass on oh, this, isn't she? Look, I wouldn't be that harsh. I think Sally makes some good points. Mm. Um, Sally, do you care for a right reply on that one before I weigh in? I, I, could, I couldn't hear it. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was saying <laughs> that uh, he gave you... A, you were giving the Facebook a free kick. Oh, absolutely not. The thing with Facebook, though, is you can read the terms of conditions of Facebook and you can opt out of it. And so... Like, I love Facebook, I think it's really fun and I'm far less worried about the overreach and surveillance and manipulation of Facebook than I am of the overreach and surveillance of our government and the police. Um, I think social media is fun and does a lot of good in the world. All right. Well, if you are interested in hearing what the platforms have to say, Twitter has given us a statement that's up on our website right now. We did invite Twitter to participate in this. We also invited Google and Facebook. None of them could make anyone available. We've tried them lots of times during the year and we will continue to invite them on this program. We know that you have loads of questions for them. The next question tonight comes from Trish dawson Kermode in the studio. Hi. We seem to be one of a diminishing number of parents who've held off allowing our kids to have social, their own social media um, before about 13 or 14, like Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, um, as the experts seem to recommend. Uh, we discuss with our kids why we follow the guidelines and they tell us that for most of their friends through about 11 to 14 that social media dominates their day-to-day -day conversations and their day-to-day -day activities, actually. Uh, this sees, sees them sometimes feeling left out socially and because uh, they aren't always in the know or have something to show. Um, and at the same time, they understand the unhealthy side where there can be bullying, um, there can be superficiality and um, judgment that occurs. So is there still a case for parental responsibility 
or should we just all give in to let them fit in? Absolutely. Parents are the front line of defense. Um, we need to set the limitations. We need to be engaged in their online lives the way we, we are their everyday lives. And I'd say keep doing what you're do, doing, hold out. I want to go back to one of Sally's points. And it's interesting because adult cyber abuse is different in character. It tends to be strangers versus um, youth-based cyberbullying, which is almost always peer-to-peer -peer, um, and extension of social conflict happening within the school gates. So sometimes it's social exclusion, it's creating drama, creating rumors. But what makes it so insidious is it doesn't stop at the mm. school gates. It's pervasive and invasive, and it follows children into their pockets. We've got supercomputers into our pockets now um, to, to all hours of the day. Um, and only 50% of young people will talk to a trusted adult when something goes wrong. So parents, this is a preeminent parenting challenge. Our parents didn't have to deal with this type of thing. If, we, if you go to esafety.gov.au, we've got tons of information for parents because prevention through education and awareness is the first cornerstone to solving some of these issues. Jack and Matt, were you having these conversations with your parents during your teenage years? No, I no. think it was, I was about 17 or 18 yeah. before I got yeah, Instagram. And back then, Instagram was nothing. It was like you couldn't message anyone. It was just like you'd post a photo and then maybe check like a month yeah. later. Like it was nothing to <laughs> yeah. what it is now. Nothing. And then, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I think it's horrible. Like, even parents give an iPad, you see out for dinner, they give a kid like an iPad and they're like six years old to shut them up. And you're okay, like, I, I'm feeling yeah. very attacked as a parent. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. When you have children, come back to yeah, me. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it doesn't work anymore. 81% of Australian four-year-olds have access to a connected device. But what we have to remember is that you know, the digital babysitters, the TV that our parents used to put us in front of were passive entertainment mechanisms. These are interactive devices where kids can come across terrorist content and, um, mm. you know, really scary things. So, Mark, you've got two kids. Yes. What was the conversation <laughs> at home uh, when they were born about putting them on social media? <laughs> you, you, you take oh, a lot of selfies. Just texted them. Uh, yeah. The kids are in them a lot. It was in the womb. It was, yeah, it was it's the interesting because I, we have some friends who, uh, and I, I respect them for doing this, they've, they've kept all their kids offline and they, they want to have a clean slate for when they launch. And I must confess, <laughs> we joked about it, you know, we hadn't slept for half a decade, so if the least we can do is get good content out of it, we're going to put them on the internet. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we're very careful about what, the way we do it. And look, I think there's generally too much judgment with parenting anyway. But I think, you know, we had some basic rules about, you know, never posting while we're at a location, never posting location details, you, you can't see school uniforms, stuff like that. There's no... This is, this is about us posting pictures of our kids, right? In terms of actually them getting a device, literally, my six-year-old's like, when am I getting a phone? I'm like, OK, back up, buddy. Yeah. That's not happening for a while. And I, I lent on the you have to be 13, wait for the terms and conditions stuff. But I think it's going to get harder. And, you know, not a day goes by where I'm incredibly grateful that social media did not exist mm. when I was in year 10, 11, 12. Why? Because so, I would have posted some... In incredibly oh. terrible things that I would be <laughs> scrubbing from the internet as we speak. <laughs> yeah. And that's a hard thing to live with. You know, there, ha there was a movement uh, a few years ago, a couple of commercial services that would basically offer you a service that would, they would go in and scrub your digital identity mm. clean. Now, I reckon some of them would have been shysters, but if you can come up with an effective tool that would scrub your, your, your footprint clean at age 18 or when you want to go get that job and become a cop or run for parliament, There'd be some money in that, I reckon. <laughs> uh, I want to bring Peter Strokel back in. You asked the first question. I think you've got three kids. Yeah, sadly, yes. <laughs> <one of them. laughs> Do they know you feel that way? <laughs> They're tired. Yeah. How concerned are you about their use of devices and apps yeah. and addiction even? OK, so I've got three kids between 18 and 13. And we were debating a lot about what's the right amount of time. And we, we used to say, oh, two hours a day, right? Well, that went like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and the, the incredibly different, difficult thing for parents to do is to judge between how much social interaction goes on online that, yeah. that is really useful and, and, and helpful versus how much distraction and, and influence goes on, mm. right? Mm. And, and as a parent from the outside, you can't really judge that yeah. unless you look over their shoulder all the Do you time. go into their phones? No, not me. I, I, okay. I wouldn't even know how. <laughs> so, uh, are yeah. there big arguments about this stuff? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> not so much with this one, because she's 13 and she's not getting her phone until... Well, she's getting one now. <laughs> 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 but, but the... Um, 
as, as puberty progresses, the, the debates got quite robust, yeah. Uh, Jocelyn, clearly no simple answer here, but this seems to be something that most families experience. Absolutely, yeah. the screen time debate. And I've talked um, for several years that we need to get beyond kind of counting digital calories in terms of just tracking time online and really thinking about the content and the, the quality of the content that's being consumed and the interactions that are happening, as well as the context. So obviously this year the context has been we're in a pandemic and we are on screens more. We needed to then focus on that, you know, more nutritious, like interactive kind of um, stuff. So, I mean, look, they're, they're big issues that I deal with all the time in terms of feeling left out because you're not having that. Um, I never got a Dolly magazine, so I was, you know, <laughs> never was a part of that. But we used to crowd around that one person who did have that magazine. We would crowd around and consume that together and go through that together as opposed to our own feeds of information. And, and I guess as the doco points out, there's, you know, we can't dose kids with the same kind of nutritious um, virtual vitamins, they are going to cre create their own algorithms that serve them different things. And the conversations that you can have with them now are probably the most important educational pieces that you'll have, you know, conversations that you'll have in terms of the critical thinking that goes into even how they argue with you about why they need Triller, which you can go home and Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question tonight comes from Taufik Huck in the studio. What worries me most about social media is how it's polarising people to such an extent that uh, we're almost starting to live in different realities. Uh, this has implications with politics and uh, the rise of conspiracy theories. What regulations, whether from uh, government or industry, uh, should be considered to counter this trend towards polarisation? All right, well, we've put this question to Tristan Harris. This is a very challenging area um, because it obviously uh, hits on a, a, you know, a value that many societies hold of free speech. Um, but I think what we have to distinguish is the difference between free speech and free reach. No one is saying that we cannot say what we believe. I think the question we have to ask is, does everyone have a God-given right to reach hundreds of millions or billions of people without any of the corresponding responsibility? Uh, as an example, Alex Jones, uh, who's the conspiracy, conspiracy theory uh, video uh, guy who does Infowars, he was recommended by YouTube 15 billion times. This is someone who said that um, the Sandy Hook parents whose kids were, were, were killed at the school, that, that was just they were just crisis actors. That's the kind of stuff that's getting recommended billions and billions of times. Flat Earth conspiracy theories were recommended hundreds of millions of times. I think in COVID times, when you set your children in front of uh, YouTube because you have to walk away and do something and cook or go to work, and then you come back uh, to, and your kids are saying the Holocaust didn't happen, you have to ask, is this by accident or is this because of a business model that rewards these conspiracy theories? So are you saying then hold these platforms to the same standards as, as publishers? That and also that and also in a decentralized sense, each of us are now publishers and broadcasters. Uh, so we have we are now have the power as individuals to broadcast to millions and billions of people without any of the corresponding responsibility. So if I wanted to lie or make something up right now uh, and I had my own podcast or I had my own video channel, nothing's going to stop me. There's no accountability for that. I can just make up facts. In fact, the least ethical actors win in the attention economy because those are the ones who are least constrained. The more willing you are to say anything, the better you are at getting away with, with anything, which is exactly why fake news spreads six times faster than true news, because it's an unconstrained space of speech, as opposed to if I only say true things, I'm, I'm limited in saying only things that grammatically line up with the truth. So that's just a smaller set of, of items so that the, the unethical actor wins basically in this circumstance. So I'm interested in that argument, Mark, because what you guys have been saying is you've got to get the platforms to take more responsibility. Yeah. He's saying actually the individuals maybe taking responsibility might solve this problem. Just on a very practical level, just to take his slightly straw manny argument about you put your kids in front of a, a YouTube and they come back saying the Holocaust didn't happen. I mean, there are literally things like YouTube kids and ABC kids and things like that you can put your kids in front of. So just on a practical level, it doesn't have to be that bad, right? Um, in terms of... I, maybe the best way to think about it is, is, is a symbiotic relationship, right? No one's saying that we shouldn't change our behaviours and we shouldn't be better informed about what's happening to us. I just don't want to take that responsibility away from the gazillion dollar companies, right? So I think it's important to understand that there is a measure of shared responsibility shared between the two. And then, yes, government does come into it well, although just historically speaking, governments don't tend to be that great 
at regulating some of this stuff, generally speaking. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you probably landed on a different conclusion to me, but, you know, there have been various different points over uh, both here in Australia and in the US and the UK where different kinds of regulation have been brought in and often they have unintended consequences. So if the platforms were to take responsibility, are we talking about changes, tweaks to the algorithms to ensure that people aren't seeing different versions of reality? Well, I would say... I mean, the thing I was saying earlier about just a little tool to tell you why you're seeing something, to me, is just a relatively simple, actionable start, right? Um, the other thing to think about is the fact that, you know, when... Just to take Facebook as an example, because I think Facebook's probably, like, more central to this than things like Google. They can only pull from an inventory of content to fill stuff up in your feed. They can get better about deciding what even gets into the list of inventory in the first place. And so when you see them... So what, is it, what do you mean by that? Uh, I, I think there are some things they should have banned outright a really long time ago. And they always wait for somebody to criticise them publicly before they do it. And they are big enough and rich enough and probably fast enough at this point to stop it before it gets to a stage where gazillions of people... I'm, stop, I'm going to stop saying gazillions. Uh, where lots of people uh, believe that the Holocaust didn't happen or the world is flat. They have the power and they should have done it a long time they, ago. They banned Holocaust denial tweets last week. Um, people have been denying the Holocaust since the 1940s. Obviously, the platforms weren't around. But again, um, the whole idea of safety by design is that if you build the digital roads, you also need to erect the guardrails. You need to police the roads for dangerous drivers so that other users don't end up being the casualties. Um, but I, I strongly believe it ch takes cultural change and ethos of moving fast and breaking things and profits at all costs to actually building platforms and designing them with safety and human dignity at the core. I think that's an easier proposition and something that they can do and a journey we've been going on with the companies through safety by design versus what Tristan is, is recommending and changing wildly successful revenue models, what government is going to take the economic engine of the US economy during the midst of the worst global um, you know, depression and tell them you've got to change the way you, you make money? You know, they are businesses looking for profit and they answer to shareholders. OK, let's take our next question tonight. It's from Christopher Ojala in the studio. Thanks, Hamish. How do you explain a recent visit I made to a car dealership to have my car serviced where I was asked if I wanted windshield wipers replaced, to which I declined their offer? Within an hour of leaving the dealership, I'd started getting ads for windshield wipers on my phone. <laughs> I have never searched for wipers on my phone and it's not something that comes up in my daily conversation. So if my phone is not always listening, how the hell did I end up getting these windshield wiper <laughs> ads on my phone? Jack and Matt. I'd like to know. <laughs> I, I want to know this question as well. This happens to us all the time. We always talk about Every this. Every day. Well, yeah. I was looking up back braces for some weird reason. No, not looking them up. I was talking about them with, with you. And then the next day, they were just popping up everywhere. So did you buy any? No. <laughs> Probably should have. But, but do, you, do you actually investigate it? Do you go that next step and try and figure out why this, is, this stuff's happening? No, I haven't. I, I asked someone, I think it was someone from Instagram, uh, why it happened, but I swear they said that it was because you um, searched it. Because I thought it was from just speaking, like Siri or something. I have no yeah. idea, but... They are adamant yeah. that they don't use... Like, Facebook in particular, and this has come up a lot over the years and we've covered it on Download, they are adamant that they are not using your microphone and it's very, it's very hard to believe they them have to sometimes, yeah. but they are adamant about it. Yeah, how can they not, though? Like, well, that example, right? There. I mean, just to take your example, without knowing the complete ins and outs of the algorithm, which, by the way, we should know because it's marketing to us, I would say they probably gathered your location data that you were at a place and they probably concluded that um, you didn't buy a car, so you were probably interested in accessories and... But that's, I mean, that is at a guess. And what part is. of my issue with why I would like a thing underneath saying this is why you're being advertised this is so it doesn't feel creepy. I actually think it's better for the platforms if you take the creepiness out of it and you have some transparency under mm -hmm. why they're selling you stuff. I actually mm. think it's better for trust. And that's the biggest issue facing, from, from a monetary, monetary standpoint, the biggest issue that's facing Facebook and Google now, particularly YouTube, they're considered to be unsafe places to advertise because people don't trust them. And if they were a little bit more transparent, I don't think they'd make any less money and I think we'd probably trust them a lot more. I don't and Sally, think do you get this stuff popping on up your on, your, on your feet? I don't know. 
Yeah, I do all the time. I think it's probably a location thing. Um, yeah, it's pretty creepy when it happens. Um, I just, I'm going to be really cheeky. I just want to go back <laughs> to the last question that I wanted to jump in on about regulated, regulation changes that we could make to a social media platform like Facebook because I think it's really simple. I think there's three things we can do. Um, I think, um, like, obviously we cannot track every single person who ever tells a lie and stops, you know, stop everybody from telling a lie. But... Facebook can make sure that verified accounts, media accounts and lobby groups uh, do not spread fake news. Like, they can implement that level of checks on those posters. Um, they can crack down on bot farms that can give the impression of, you know, support for an idea or endorsement en masse. And they can also de-platform really bad faith actors. Uh, Alex Jones was mentioned by Tristan. Um, Facebook recently removed Pete Evans, which which is fantastic. Mm. So there's three things that Facebook can do straight away. And the way we make them do it is by organising together online, taking collective, collective action and hitting Facebook where it hurts. You know, we have the power as the users of this platform to see the changes that we want to make, but we've just got to work together. Man, I thought, I thought we were going to get through a whole show without a mention of Pete Evans, but it wasn't to be. <laughs> that is all we've got time for tonight. Would you please thank our wonderful panel, Julia Inman-Grant, Mark Fennell, Sally Rugg, the inspired unemployed, they're Jack Steele and Matt Ford, and Jocelyn Brewer. Thank you to all of them. Thank you. <laughs> Next week on the program, trust, ethics, accountability are the standards of our political leaders slipping as we grapple with this national crisis. Uh, thanks to you for all of your questions tonight. Have a very good night.